Open your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter number 1, please. Second Peter chapter number 1. <clears throat> and while you're turning there just to get the elephant out of the room, the reason I have blue shoes, blue pants, a blue belt, a blue tie, and a blue shirt, and a blue jacket is because we had spirit week at our school this week. And so I was team blue, um, and you guys are going to appreciate the name of our team. We were the, ju- were the junior high class mixed with the second graders, and our team name was the Boomers. The Boomers, Okay. <laughs> So, um, and believe it or not, I didn't pick that. One of the students in the older class came to me and said, oh, I bet your kids really like that name. And I was like, I didn't pick it out. In fact, it was your granddaughter. We were thinking about names, and she said, how about the boomers? And I said, oh, what? No, you guys aren't even millennials. And and so I said, all right, let's take a vote. I said, how many want to be the boomers? And they all raised their hand. And I was like, wow, do they know what that means? Do they know what that is? So... Hence why I'm wearing so much blue, and hence also why my voice is cracking and not quite all there. We've been screaming all week and yelling, and so yeah. First Peter, chapter number one. I'm going to start reading verse number one through verse number ten. Second Peter one, one through ten. Second, did I say first? It is second. I apologize. It is second. Spirit Week has caused my mind to go bonkers. It is second Peter, not first. Second Peter chapter number one. I would have started reading and you guys would have said he's gone liberal. He's reading another version. What's going on here? Second Peter chapter number one, starting in verse number one. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask that you would Help me tonight as I preach your word. I ask that you'd use me. I ask that your Holy Spirit would um, convict the hearts of the hearers. And I ask for your power tonight, Lord. And I ask that you would sustain my voice as I preach your word tonight, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I want to preach tonight, and I don't know, this may be a little more teachy than preachy, but principles for finding the will of God for your life. Principles for finding the will of God for your life. Now, this sermon, you hear this title and you may think, oh, this is a sermon for teenagers. Well, this is a sermon for all of us, myself included, because there's always the, the will of God, the future will of God, the next step for us in our Christian faith that we need to follow. And so finding God's will for our life is a very important thing. Now, there are some people who wander life with no direction, no purpose, and can never seem to figure out what God has for them. Um, they're constantly wondering, well, what does God want for this? What does God have for this in my life? Well, I just don't know. And they don't know anything. They have no idea what God's will is for them in any area. They're constantly wandering. And they're constantly uh, with questions of, I, I don't know what God has for me. Well, I, I, I want to teach slash preach you tonight on principles for finding the will of God for your life. Number one, um, I want you to notice in verse number three, according as his divine power hath given us 
given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. I want you to notice that God gives us the means to succeed spiritually. He gives us the means. God does not call us to something that we cannot do. Now, we have to do that thing through Jesus Christ, but God's not going to call us to something and, and with, the, with the sole purpose of us failing. He gives us the means to success spiritually. God wants you to succeed spiritually. He doesn't want you to fail. God doesn't want you to fall on your face. God isn't laughing when you fall down and you, and you mess up. God wants you to succeed as a Christian, and he gives us the means to do so. Verse number 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. We see that he gives us great and precious promises in all through Scripture. There are amazing promises that God has for us. I think of Hebrews 13, 5. He will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Okay, God is never going to leave you. God is not going to leave you stranded. I think of John 10, 28. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. So when God gives you eternal life, you, you can't lose it. You're never going to perish. That is a promise from God. I think of Romans 10, 12. The Lord is rich unto all that call upon Him. So anyone who calls on the name of Jesus and asks for salvation, God is rich unto all of them, and God promises salvation for those who have faith and simply ask for salvation. I think of Jeremiah 33, 3. Call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. What a great promise that is to us. God wants us to call unto him, and God wants to do great and mighty things in your lives. God has these promises for us, these great promises for us. I think of Malachi 3.10, where, and Pastor mentioned this in a, in a last sermon, prove me herewith if I will not pour out you a blessing. And he's talking about those who tithe. He says, hey, if you tithe, if you give me what's mine, prove me to see or test me uh, to see if I won't pour out blessings to you. So that is a promise from God that if we tithe, if we give God what is His, that God will pour out blessings, financial blessings, specifically upon our lives. Promises of God, great and mighty promises of God. I think of Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What a great promise this is for us. Those, you say, I'm weary. I have a heavy burden in my life. And Jesus says, hey, come unto me, and I will give you rest. God wants to give us rest when we're carrying a burden. Too many times we try to bear it on our own. And Jesus says, hey, come to me and I will give you rest. What a great promise that is as us, for, as Christians. I think of Isaiah 54.10, For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee. I think of James 1.5, if, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally. So God has some wonderful promises for us. Great and precious promises, the Word of God says. And as Christians, we should claim these promises and we should let these promises of God encourage us. Next, it's by these promises that give us the opportunity to partake of the divine nature. Verse number uh, 4 it says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these, well, what is these, the great and precious promises, ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So it is through these promises that gives us an opportunity to partake in the divine nature or the, the qualities of God, the, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, the, 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 the godliness that we desire. God has promises for us that we can live in a godly manner. Now, in the next set of verses, it goes through a list of things. Before I get to those list of things, I want you to look at verse number 8 of 2 Peter 1. <clears throat> verse number 8 says this, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is a promise to us. Before I really get into detail of these verses, we're going to go through these things that God says if you have these things and they abound, that you will, be, you will not be barren. 
nor unfruitful. And then there's another promise in verse 9 to us, which we'll go over in just a minute. So, first of all, I need uh, Jet. Would you come up here, please? I want Jet to hold this sign here. Just stand on this step and face the audience here. So the first thing we see is faith. Faith. It says in verse, the Bible says in verse number 5, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Now I think it's interesting to me that it says that you're adding these things to your faith. Okay? Ephesians 6.16 says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, whereby ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now I want to get just uh, something out here, a little illustration. We have a shield here. Thank you, Brother Lopez. This is from Brother Lopez's office. It's a very heavy shield. Now the Bible says above all, taking the shield of faith. Above all, above all the other parts of the armor of God, God says, taking the shield of faith. And he says, if you have the shield of faith, then you'll, you will be able to quench all of the fiery darts of the wicked. Quench means to put out, to extinguish, or to absorb. So any attack that Satan has towards you, anything he throws your way, discouragement, tragedy, trials, uh, any bump in the road that you come across, uh, the, the, the darts of Satan, when Satan is throwing things at you, trying to hurt you, if you have the shield of faith, you shall be able to quench all of the fiery darts of the wicked. And so in this passage, it says you're adding to your faith. So faith in this passage is the main thing. It is the, the main thing of substance that God wants us to have is this faith, and then we're adding to our faith. And so the shield of faith will quench all of the fiery darts of the wicked. Next is virtue. Mr. Seth, would you come up here, please? Seth, stand right next to Jet right here. And so next we have virtue. Virtue is uprightness, integrity, purity. And so in this list of things that God has a promise for us, one of these things is virtue. God wants us to have virtue. And so ask yourself tonight, Christian, do I have uprightness, integrity, purity? Do I have that virtue? So God promises us these blessings if we have this list of things. Faith, virtue, and if I could have Mr. Uh, Lopez, Mr. Max Lopez, come up here, please. Not this Mr. Lopez. He got nervous. Brother Lopez over here, he's like, uh-oh, uh-oh, I'm getting nervous here. Okay, Mr. Max, knowledge. Knowledge. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge. Ephesians 4.14 says this, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, and cutting, cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So God wants us to have knowledge. He wants us to have knowledge of God's Word because there are those who, in this world, that maybe are Christians, maybe not, but they go about and they have bad doctrine and they're trying to convince you of something. They'll say, well, this is what the Bible teaches. And it is not what the Bible teaches. And many new Christians that don't have knowledge are carried about with every wind of doctrine. Whatever is flowing, that maybe the false doctrine of Calvinism comes up and someone says, oh yeah, God elects you to go to heaven and he elects certain people to go to hell and you have no say in the matter. And, and new Christians, if they don't know the word of God, then they can often get carried away by this false doctrine. So God says these promises that he has for us, he's adding to the faith. The faith, the main thing here he's saying, to add to your faith uh, virtue and to virtue knowledge. To virtue knowledge. Mr. Derek, would you come up here? You're going to hold temperance right next to Max. You're going to hold temperance. Yes, Daniel is next. He said Daniel's next. Yes, he is. Daniel, you will be next. <laughs> next is temperance. This is moderation, self-restraint. This is very important as a Christian, that we have moderation. Our lack of temperance can be seen by the world, and it can be a stumbling block for those who are trying to come to Jesus. They could see our lack of temperance, our lack of discipline, if you will, and they could see this, and it could cause a stumbling block. So God is making a promise. He says, hey, he says, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance. And so as a Christian, we should strive for temperance. 
We should ask God to give us temperance. It is not something that is natural. It is not something that our flesh does naturally. But God wants us to have temperance, to, be, to have self-control. This world is the opposite of temperance. They go on their binges. They, the alcoholism, the, the drug addictions, um, just the, you know, living life for self, the sexual addictions that are out there. And so there is a huge lack of temperance. But God says he wants us to have temperance, to have this moderation and self-restraint. Next is patience. Mr. Daniel, if you would come up here. Stand next to Mr. Derek and hold that sign, patience. Now, as a parent, as a youth pastor, God will often test your patience. Okay? As a youth pastor, I will often see teenagers making really bad decisions. <clears throat> and the flesh part of me just wants to grab them. Why are you doing that? Stop! Okay? That, that's just my, ugh! But patience tells me, okay, I've got to love that young person. I've got to pray for that young person. I've got to gently and kindly try to talk to that young person to try to tell them, hey, you're heading in a bad direction. God tests us with patience. But God wants you to have patience. You're a parent. Either you have patience or you don't. Okay? If you have children, then God will, you will have your patience tested. But God wants us to have patience. He wants us to be patient with people, patient with our loved ones, patient with our spouse, patient with those around us. When you're sitting in traffic and the guy in front of you is going too slow, that, that, that is a thing that, I'm confessing my sin here, it frustrates me. It really does. The speed limit is 45 and he's going 40. And I'm trying to get to church, I'm trying to get to school in the morning, and I probably should have left 20 minutes earlier than I did. And so this guy's going five under, and I'm frustrated. And the Lord is telling me, be patient. Be patient. So God is saying, I want you to add to your faith. I want you to add virtue. To your virtue, add knowledge. To your knowledge, temperance. To temperance, patience. Patience. Hebrews 10.36 says this. This is a verse that I claimed when I was in Bible college as a promise. Hebrews 10.36, For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. So many times we, we want it right now. We want that we want our kids to turn out. We want a, a beautiful, wonderful marriage. We want to get married, young people. We want to, to get the next step, and we're impatient. But God says, hey, I have the will of God for you, and I want you to do something first before you receive that promise. That, that promise that God says, hey, this is what I have for you, but you've got to do this first. You know, the, the millennial generation, we want the big house the day we get married. But what we don't understand is our parents started out in a one-bedroom, little, tiny nothing, and now they have a big house. We grew up in a big house, so we just think, oh, as soon as I get married, I just get a five-bedroom house. Okay, no patience in the millennial generation. Oh, they think, oh, I'm going to graduate college and start making $200,000 a year. But they don't understand, our, the parents may be making good money, but they didn't start out there. They started out small. They started out working hard. Patience. God says, for ye have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. So sometimes we see the promise that God has. We see it. We want it. We want it right now. God, I want this now. But God says, hey, be patient. There's something that you need to do first. There's some things you have to do. You have to follow the steps of God. What we want to do is we just want to jump. We want to jump from point A to point Z. And God says, wait, wait, you skip points B, C, D, E, F, G. You've got, to, you've got to follow God's will one step at a time. But too many times we're very impatient. I see this with young people. They want to get married so quickly. And God says, oh, hold up. Just wait. There's some things I want you to do first. Some things I want you to do. Before you get married, you need to, you need to be mature. You need to get this in order. And so what is it? Yes, God has a will for you, young people. He has someone for you to marry one day, but don't, 
jump the gun and think, oh, I've got to get married as soon as I graduate from high school. You don't have to do that. I'm going to be single the rest of my life. No, no, don't worry. God has someone for you. But patience. God has a will for all of us. He has something for us to do. But God says, hey, the will of God first, and then you're going to receive that promise. So patience. Patience. In this list of things, adding to your faith, virtue, to your virtue, knowledge, to your knowledge, temperance, to temperance, patience. Next, Mr. Clayton, come on up here. Godliness. Go ahead and stand on the other side of the handle there. Next is godliness. Definition for godliness is careful observance of or conformity or conformity to the laws of God. Careful observance of or conformity to the laws of God. In this lineup of things that God says, hey, this is what I want of you. One of those things is godliness. God wants us to conform ourselves to the image of Christ. He wants us to conform ourselves to this book right here. He wants us to be godly. When we live a sensual, carnal, worldly life, we are not living a godly life. And God wants us to live godly. He wants us to follow Christ. And and whatever God has for us, God, you don't want me to do this? I'm not going to do it. God, you want me to live this certain way? You have some boundaries for me? You have some guidelines that you want me to do? God, I'll do that. What is that? That is godliness. That is telling God, God, whatever it is that you have for me, even if it's something maybe I enjoy, okay? Alcoholics enjoy their liquor. But if we're to live a godly life, we're to abstain from alcohol. Drug addicts like getting that high. But if we're to live a godly life, we're to stay sober. The Bible commands us to be sober. When you are not in control of your faculties, you are no longer sober. I was preaching at the jail on Tuesday and I was talking a little bit about sobriety or being sober and I told the gentleman, I said, you can go to any AA and they will tell you that if you take one drink, you are no longer sober. Oh, I can handle my liquor. No, one drink and you're no longer sober. One drink and you're disobeying God's command to be sober. It alters your mind. Alcohol alters your mind. And God does not want us taking mind-altering substances. And so, soberness. God wants us to be sober, and that is part of being godly. Godliness is simply obeying God. Godliness is simply living a holy and a righteous life. And so God says, hey, I want you to add to your faith. I want you to add virtue. I want you to add, let's see if I can read it, knowledge, temperance, patience, and godliness. So God wants us to add these things. Next, Mr. Corbin. Mr. Corbenberg, come on up here. You're going to be brotherly kindness. So if you would stand on the other side of Clayton there. I'm going to hold the brotherly kindness. There we go. Brotherly kindness. God wants us to have brotherly kindness one toward another. Okay? Uh Uh-oh, what's going on up there? Brotherly kindness. How do we treat our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? Do we treat them with brotherly kindness? The Bible says, And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven us. So God wants us to have kindness. Are we kind in our words? Are we kind in our actions? Are we kind to those around us? God says, hey, I have this faith, and I want you to add all these things to your faith. And one of those things is brotherly kindness. We should strive for brotherly kindness. If, if we're coarse, We should say, God, help me not to be so coarse and so harsh. Help me to have brotherly kindness one toward another. Next and last, Mr. Josiah. You would hold charity. Go to the end of the line there, hold charity. And Josiah thought he was getting out of it. Nope. (laughs) Charity. This is a Christ-like love. This is an unconditional love. This is the kind of love that says, I will love you regardless of how you treat me. As a parent, I will love you as my child. I will love my child regardless of the choices they make in life. I may not be pleased with those choices. I may have to rebuke those choices. I may have to correct them, but I still love. This says, I will love those the way Jesus loved me. This is a Christ-like 
unconditional love. And we, we know from the book of 1 Corinthians that charity is a very important thing. It, it doesn't matter how eloquent we are. It doesn't matter how much of a good speaker we are, how much we feed the poor, how much money we give to charity. If we don't have charity or love, then God says we're like a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. In other words, just, just an annoying noise in the ear. Just an annoyance. If we don't have charity, Christian, it's important that we have charity, that we truly love God one another, that we are not two-faced, that our love is not with dissimulations, and dissimulations, I talked about this last week in our teen class, means being two-faced. It means, hey, how you doing, brother? Good to see you. Oh, I can't stand Gary. He's such a jerk. Oh, man. Okay? So that is not charity. Charity would be, hey, I love you, brother, and then, you know what, Gary, he's such a good guy, man. I appreciate that, brother. Okay? That is love. That is charity. That is that is, that is an honesty. And God wants us to have charity. He wants us to love people. Christian, how do you love people tonight? Do you love the people at Elmwood Baptist Church? Is there someone at Elmwood Baptist Church that you have a dislike for, a hatred for, that you don't want to talk to them? And when you see them, oh, I don't want to talk to that person. How's our love? How's our charity? Do we truly love people? Do we truly love those around us? You know, the Bible says that they shall know that you're my disciples by your what? By your love one, love one for another. It didn't say they shall know that you're my disciples by the Bible you carry or by the clothes you wear to church or by the, the type of car you drive or by what you say. He said by your love one for another. That's how the world is going to know that we're Christians because the world has a very conditional love. The world loves you if you have money. The world loves you as long as you're popular. The world loves you as long as you're cool. The world loves you if you're good looking. The world loves you if they can climb the ladder of success and you can help them climb that ladder. The world loves you if you can give them something in return. So when they see us as Christians love each other with no strings attached, for no reason, and in many cases, loving each other when it's not logical to do so because that person was unkind to you, but you still love them in return, that's how. That is how they're going to know that we're the disciples of Jesus Christ. So God says, to this faith, we're going to add virtue, into virtue, knowledge, into knowledge, temperance, into temperance, patience, into patience, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness, charity. Charity, love. And then in verse number 8, the Bible says, for these things, what is these, these things? That's this right here in front of you. These things be in you and abound. So if these things are in you and they abound in you. In other words, it's the, it's the main, it is mo- these things are mostly in the majority of the time you have these things. Not that you're perfect, no one is but they abound in you that they make, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a great promise. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be barren. I don't want to be unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to be fruitful. I want to produce. I want God to use my life in a mighty way. I want God to be able to use my life to influence others for him. I want God to be able to use me in a great way. But if we don't have these things, we're not going to have that promise applied to us. Thank you, boys. You boys can be seated. You can take the signs with you. Verse number 9. Verse number 9 says, and if you, but, if, but he that lacketh these things. So if we don't have these qualities that were just mentioned. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. So what does that mean? Obviously, that's not literal. You don't go blind physically if, if you don't have these qualities. This is a metaphor for a spiritual blindness. So if you do not have these things, and um, let's see here, I lost my spot. So if you don't have these things, we will not have a spiritual perception. And so there are many people who, well, I don't know, should I, should 
Should I take this job that is going to work me on Sunday? Or, or should I go to church? I don't know. What's wrong? There's no spiritual perception. Well, you know what? Should I date this girl who's not saved? I don't know. What should I do? No spiritual perception. Blindness. Well, you know, I don't know. Should, should I tithe? I just don't know. I don't know if I should tithe or not because things are a little tight. What is that? That is blindness. No spiritual perception. Cannot see clearly what God has for us. Well, I don't know. You know, I know should, should I go to the bar with my friends? I'm not going to drink or anything, but should I just go? What is that? There is that's a spiritual blindness. No spiritual perception. And the Bible says they cannot see afar off. So these people who do not have these things, they cannot clearly see the will of God. And it's just a fog. It's a blindness. And they want to, I, I just don't know. I don't know if, if, if I should do this. Well, there's a blindness because God has some very clearly laid out things, ways he wants us to live. So if you lack these things, you will have no spiritual perception. And then next it says you will forget from whence you came. It says in the verse here that, and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. If we're not careful, we get a spiritual blindness and we forget where we came from. We forget that God, what God had to save us from. And we think, oh, I'm, I'm a good Christian. I'm such a great Christian. Oh, I'm better than that person. Oh, look at that. Oh, that person, they look homeless coming into church. Oh, oh, I don't want them in here. Oh, those bus kids, the dirty little bus kids running around everywhere. Oh, that person, oh, look at the way they're dressed. Oh, I can't believe they're coming to church today. We forget where we came from. We forget that we are likewise a sinner saved by grace. That we are likewise, we were in the dregs of sin. Well, I got saved, you say, well, I got saved when I was a little kid. We were in the dregs of sin bound for hell. Bound for hell. We deserve hell as much as the drug addict or the rapist or the murderer deserves hell because we're sinners. And if we're not careful, that blindness will keep us from seeing that. And then we start to think of ourselves highly, and we know what the Bible says about when you think of yourself highly, you'll fall. So if you lack these things, these qualities that God has for us, there can be a lot of spiritual consequences. Verse number 10 says, Wherefore, or in other words, for this reason, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye shall do these things, ye shall never fall. This verse happens to be my dad's life verse. A fabulous verse. So God wants us to make our calling and election or our salvation sure. Because here's, here's what happens. God calls us to something. Then maybe a year down the road, we start to question that calling. Did God really call me that? I don't know. Maybe I was just in the moment. And God says, hey, make your calling and election sure. In other words, know what God has called you to. I can tell you being in the ministry, I haven't been in the ministry a whole lot compared to people like Pastor Randall or the Knutsons. But I have been in ministry for some time, and I can tell you the devil often says, did God really call you to the ministry? Is that really what he wants you to do? Are you sure about that? And God will call you to things, and if you're not careful, young people, God will call you to preach. God will call you to serve him. And then what happens maybe a year down the road? Well, God didn't really call me to that. I was just, I was, just, I was just in my emotions and I just made a decision and it wasn't really God. Hey, make your calling and election sure. Make it sure. When God calls you to something, when God tells you something, boy, make certain of it because Satan is going to do everything he can to get you away from that calling. He's going to do everything he can to stop you from doing what he has called you to and making your election, your salvation sure. Know you're saved. Don't think you're saved. Don't hope you're saved. Know you're saved. You know, I always encourage people, if you aren't 100% dead dog sure that you are saved, well, you get it settled. Get it settled. I don't care if you call it reassurance of your salvation. I don't care what you call it. Just get your salvation settled. Well, I think I got saved when I was a kid. I kind of remember it. Boy, get, get it settled. Don't think. How terrible would it be if someone died and went to hell because they thought they were saved? What a horrible... Can you imagine being in hell? I could have gotten saved. I was in a Baptist church and I thought I was saved, but I wasn't. What a terrible feeling that would be. 
And I'm sure there will be people in hell that thought they were saved. That were 95% sure. Well, you know, I kind of remember getting saved. Boy, no, no, you're saved. If you can't remember the experience of salvation, that's a dangerous thing. Not that you have to know a date. I don't know the date I got saved, but I remember when I got saved. I remember as clear as the day I got married. Know your salvation. Make your calling and election sure. And then the Bible says in the latter half of that verse, for if you do these things, what things? All the things mentioned all the way from verse 4. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. Oh, well, that's kind of an exaggeration, don't you think? Never fall. If God says never fall, that means never fall. Now, the context of fall, not talking about sin. That's not the context of it. It's the context of the verse is you're not going to fall in your calling and your election. In other words, what God has called you to, you're not going to fall. Why? Because you made sure of it. When the devil attacks, when the devil tries to get you out of your calling and tries to say, hey, that's not really what you, what you should be doing right now with your life. No, Satan. Even when you're at your lowest point, if you make that calling, sure. Nope, devil, I know you want me to quit. I'm not going to, because I know this is what God called me to. I know that God has called me to teach this Sunday school class. I know that God has called me to serve somewhere at Elmwood Baptist Church. I know, I know God wants me at Elmwood Baptist Church. Because I promise you, there will be times where the devil, maybe you get in a spat with someone, maybe the preacher says something you don't necessarily like, you know what the devil's going to do? Oh, maybe you shouldn't be here. Oh, yeah. But if you know that God has called you to Elmwood Baptist Church, then you could, even in the darkest times when you feel like quitting, you can say with confidence, I know God has called me here. I know this is where I'm supposed to be. Making your calling and election sure, and if you do these things, you shall never fall. Never fall. So tonight, make your calling and your election sure. So how can we find God's will for our life? Well, ask God for those qualities so that the young men were holding in front of you. Strive for them. Seek for them. God wants us to live fruitful lives. He wants us, and he gives us the capability to have these things. And God wants these things, and if we have these things, we will, we will not be barren or unfruitful. And God says we will not be blind, and if we lack these things, we are blind and cannot see afar off. And we are going to stumble through life aimlessly, constantly wondering, I wonder what God's will is for my life. Well, I just don't, I just don't understand what's going on. I mean, should I do this? Should I, should I do this? Should I do that? But if you have a clarity, a spiritual perception, God, this is what God wants for me. I know this. This is what God has. Now, I want to give you a few other biblical principles to find in God's will for your life. Number one, stay sensitive to the voice of God. Stay sensitive to the voice of God. In 1 Samuel 28, 15, the story of Samuel, Samuel lost the voice of God. 1 Samuel 28, 15 says, And Samuel said to Saul, why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore have I called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I, what I shall do. Ephesians 4.30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So God says in the, Samuel, in the story with Samuel and Saul, Saul had lost hearing the voice of God because of his grievous sin, his constant disobedience to God. And I can tell you, Christian, when we live in a constant state of unrepentant sin, we break fellowship, right? Brother Coomer talked a whole lot about that. Well, our fellowship with God breaks, and we no longer can hear God's voice. And then we can honestly say, well, when I drink alcohol, I don't feel bad about it. I don't have any conviction about it. Well, maybe we stopped hearing God's voice because we've been living in disobedience for so long. We have grieved the Holy Spirit of God. Well, I can do this, and I don't feel bad about it. We've grieved the Holy Spirit. We're not sensitive to God's voice. Be sensitive to the voice of God. Next, how can we know the will of God for our life? By, number two, by doing the revealed will of God today. 1 Kings chapter 13, and I'm hastening, chapter, uh, verses 7 through 9, the Bible says this, And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. 
And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half of thine house, I will not go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For God, for so it was charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, drink no water, nor turn again by the same way that thou, thou uh, comest. So in this story here, it's a very long story. I'm not going to read the whole passage for time's sake. But a prophet goes to a king, and he prophesies to him. And the king says, come into my house, eat, drink. And this young, it is a younger prophet. And he says, no, God specifically told me not to go in thy house, not to eat food, not to drink water, but to go the, the, the way I came. And so he doesn't. He listens to God. And he doesn't drink the water, eat his food, or go into his house. Well, the Bible says he goes a little way, and he sits down by a tree. And the Bible says an older prophet comes to him, an older prophet, and says, hey, because he hears what happens. He hears about this young guy prophesying. He says, I want to meet this guy. He comes and sees him, and he sees him sitting by the tree, and he says, hey, come with me into my house. Let's eat and drink. And the young guy says, hey, no, God told me I couldn't do that. You know what this old, old prophet does? He lies to him. He says, well, an angel of the Lord came to me and told me that you're to come with me and you're to eat food and you're to drink water in my house. And the young guy says, oh, okay, well, I guess I'll go. And he goes with him. And the Bible says while they are eating, literally in the middle of them eating at this older prophet's home, God tells this older prophet to tell the young guy, because you have disobeyed me, you are going to die in the streets and your carcass is going to be eaten by a lion. And so, can you imagine being the old guy that just got this guy condemned to death? He lied to him, and now God just tells him, hey, tell this guy he's going to die now because he disobeyed me. Talk about terrible. So he tells this guy the prophecy that God actually gives him, and sure enough, the young guy goes out, a lion kills him and eats his carcass, and his carcass is there in the street. What happened? He did not obey the revealed will of God for him. There are some things that, well, what am I supposed to do a year from now? Well, I don't know. It, it doesn't necessarily matter. How about you do what God wants you to do today? You know God wants you to be in church. You know God wants you to read your Bible. You know God wants you to pray. You know this, but we worry so much about what's, what about a year from now? Where am I going to be here? Where am I going to be there? How about we do the will of God, the revealed will of God for us today? The revealed will of God for us today. So how can we fulfill the will of God for our lives by doing what God wants us to what we know God wants us to do today. Too many times we neglect what God wants us to do today, but we're anting for that thing in the future. Oh, I want this. Oh, God, what do you have for me? I, I, what house do you want me to buy? What, 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 what person, uh, job do you want me to get? Whatever. But, but then we're neglecting the clear will of God for us today. Can I tell you, we're not going to find the future will of God if we're not fulfilling the present will of God. We won't find it. <clears throat> Next. By surrendering or submitting our heart to God's will. This is a heart that is soft toward doing whatever God wants. This is an attitude. This is a posture. This is us telling God, God, whatever it is that you want me to do, that's what I'm going to do. You know why often God sometimes doesn't reveal to us his will? Because we say, well, God, I'll do everything but. God, I mean, I'll do this, but I won't do this. And then we wonder, oh, God, why, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Well, we're resisting. We're resisting the tender heart for God. We're resisting a soft heart, a heart that says, God, whatever you want me to do, that's what I'm going to do. So how can we find God's will for our life? By surrendering or submitting our heart to God's will, whatever that may be. Next. Number four, by how can we find God's will? By taking the counsel of those who have been down your path and are successful in the Christian life. Proverbs 14, 11, 14 says, Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors there is safety. Proverbs 24, 6 says, For by wise counsel thou shalt make thy war, and in the multitude of counselors there is safety. You know, I see many young people that do this. Parents give them counsel and say, hey, you know what? I think it's a bad idea. You know what young people do? Oh, my parents don't know anything. They're just old. They, they, they're not with the times. They just, they don't want me to have fun. 
They just are trying to control me. And they often will dismiss the counsel of their parents, of the pastor, of the youth pastor. And they'll just dismiss it. But God says, if you follow counsels, you shall not fall. It says, in that, it says, when you make war. So what does that mean when you make? I'm not making war. Okay, it's talking about the big decisions. Okay, a general doesn't just say, all right, we're just going to fight this country. He has a cabinet of people surrounding him. Hey, is this a good idea? Do you think this is wise to do this thing? What is that? It's a multitude of counselors. As adults, we likewise should have a multitude of counselors. Multitude of counselors. A little while ago, my wife and I went to pastor for a little counsel, and before we went into that counseling meeting, my wife and I talked, and you know what we said? We said, whatever pastor tells us, that's what we're going to do. No matter what he said. Now, that's scary. Sometimes that can feel scary. Because what if he says, counsels us to do something, the thing that we don't want to do? But you know what often happens, and I've heard pastors say this, I've heard many preachers say this, Someone goes in for counseling. Pastor, what do you think about this? And then they go and do the opposite of what the preacher just told them they should do. I mean, they asked, so we told them. What is that? That is saying, well, that's the wise counsel, but I don't want to do that. I want to do something different. Well, then the promise is, then this applies to you. Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. There is a safety in that in wise counsel. You know, uh, a drug addict wouldn't go to someone who is currently using drugs to get counsel about how to get off of drugs. A drug addict would be wise to go to someone who maybe used to be on drugs, but now is sober and is living a life for God. It says, hey, help me, what did you do? How did you get off these drugs? How did you get off this alcohol? So finding a godly Christian person who is living for the Lord, children, in, the, in your case, your parents, Boy, how amazing would it be if these young people went to their mom and dad. Mom, dad, what do you think about this decision? Some of these parents might drop over dead. Maybe, I don't know. But you know what these parents, your parents are going to think? Wow, there's some, they have wisdom. That shows great wisdom. Hey, mom, dad, should I be friends with this person? Wow, that's wisdom. Hey, mom, dad, my friends said this. They want me to do this. What do you think? Wow. What great wisdom that is. That's amazing wisdom. Boy, a multitude of counselors. A multitude of counselors. How can we find God's will? Get some wise counsel. Get some wise counsel. Sometimes the pastor may see a red flag that we don't see. And I can tell you something about pastor. Pastor is amazing in that He's not a dictator. He's not going to say, oh, okay, you need to color your house, you need to paint your car red, and you need to uh, paint your house purple. And you, pastor, pastor gives biblical counsel and he gives direction. But I can guarantee you, if pastor sees a red flag, he'll probably let you know because he doesn't want you to hurt yourself. So get wise counsel. You have a big decision to make? Talk to pastor. Ask him. Hey, pastor, I've got this big decision. What do you think? Teenagers. You have a decision to make? Talk to mom and dad. Hey, mom, what do you think about this? Dad, what do you think about this? Boy, that's wisdom. That is wisdom. One last thought and I'm done. An open door doesn't necessarily mean it's God's will. The devil, the devil can open doors and give opportunities as well. So concerning the will of God, will God just open this job up to me? Are you sure it was God? Are you sure? Because the devil can open doors too. Just because there's an open door doesn't mean God wants you to walk through it. So that's where the wise counsels come in. That's where prayer comes in. That's where seeking God's will in the matter. Not just because there's an open door and there's an opportunity right in front of us. Make sure that God is the one putting this there and not Satan opening that door for you and saying, look at this. I mean, it may not be a bad decision. It may not be something bad, I should say. It may be something sinful, but it may be bad for you <coughs> because it may, it may not be God's will for you. Seeking God's will for your life. Let's pray and we're done. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you for your...